Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this Hangout on Air with the Umedia Learning Labs Network. Um, today, we're just going to have a conversation with Tech Hive at the Lawrence Hall of Science. And I've been wanting to do this Hangout for about a month now since the Makeathon actually happened. And this was pretty impromptu. I think we decided to do this maybe two and a half weeks ago, because I really wanted to highlight this amazing work and this incredible moment that happened at Lawrence Hall before um, it ended and then just kind of fluttered away into the internet. Um, so do you guys want to go through and introduce yourselves? And then we'll talk about what the Makeathon was and uh, what Tech Hive is all about. Hi, I'm Sherry Shi. I uh, lead the Tech Hive studio here at the Lawrence Hall of Science. And I also wear the hat of a research director in the Center for Technology Innovation. Um, my name is AJ Allier. Um I am um, an engineering education specialist here at the Tech Hive. I was back on with uh, the Tech Engineering. Hi, I'm Nick Horn, and I'm a Tech Hive intern. Great. So, would you guys mind telling me a little bit about what Tech Hive is all about and how it got started, and a little bit about um, like what kind of teens go to the program and how often it happens? I'd just like to know a little bit more about the logistics of the space. Sure. So, the Tech Hive program started here at the hall about three years ago. Uh, we received funding from the Institute for Museum Library Services and the McCarthy Foundation to create a learning lab. And we currently have about 32 teams that are drawn from around the Bay Area. And they come here on Saturdays and spend their time uh, learning, doing, designing, engineering uh, with us. Um, altogether, the teams spend about 160 hours of time um, volunteering on Saturdays. Uh, and we engage them in all sorts of different activities. Sure. So, um, Ming, will you tell me a little bit about how you got started in the space and how you found out about Tech Hive and how long you've been doing it for? Um, I've been doing Tech Hive since January. And I sort of found out about it because a lot of my friends from the Girls Who Code program were actually part of Tech Hive. And they told me that I should apply. So, yeah. Yeah, so towards the end of the summer, um, of the last two summers, we've been putting out a like a application to join the Tech Hive as an intern, and this internship runs from throughout the throughout the academic school year, uh, so it starts in the fall and right before summer starts. Um, and we got, we got Ming. Um, we actually took Ming on uh, in January, uh, although she had interviewed as of the last fall. Yeah, and the program takes place in an old amphitheater here at the hall that used to be a computer laboratory. Um, just sort of split up with these different stages. Um, and it was largely an abandoned space that we had taken over to run the program. And so there's a huge pit in the middle that we use for a lot of the making activities and cutting and gluing, and then a lot of the digital work um, on the workstations. And we had to create an uh, internship model uh, to, uh, because uh, the Lawrence Hall Science is um, on top of this hill. And, um, and so we couldn't, there weren't teams that were naturally just coming to hang out here at the Lawrence Hall Science. Uh, so we had to create a, you know, a little bit more incentive for them to come uh, to make the trek all the way up here to the hall. And we actually have one who made the trek from San Jose. We have an hour and a half drive every Saturday. <laughs> Her dad was. Very happy that the, the internship ended. <laughs> uh, so Ming, you mentioned that you are part of Girls Who Code. And I'm wondering how much the experience at Girls Who Code, um, how much that prepared you for a Tech Hive internship, or if it'd be possible for, say, a person who had little coding experience, little computing experience, or whatever, how difficult would it be for them to start this internship? Um. I don't know. There, there wasn't that much overlap because Girls of Code is focused on just programming. Um, and I've done a lot more like building things here than any programming, really. Uh, so I would say that it's definitely very possible to do it without any programming experience. Cool. So I'd like to hear a little bit about um, what the Makeathon was that you guys developed. Um, so like, where did the idea come from? And a little bit about the whole, like, when did you start planning it? Because it was such a huge undertaking. 
Do you want me to start? Sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, we had, uh, so during winter break, uh, a couple of our interns um, asked uh, if we could host, if Tech Hive could host a hackathon uh, because I think hackathons are becoming more and more popular and prevalent. I mean, how often, how many hackathons have you heard of in the past year? Have I heard of? Yeah. Why not? There's like hundreds yeah. all so, over the world. Yeah. So, um, so hackathons are becoming more, more popular. So our interns asked, hey, Adrian, can, you, can we run a hackathon out of Tech Hive? And so I was like, okay, let's try it out. But when we ran our first one, like, you know, end of December, early January, uh, we realized quickly that hackathons were not very beginner friendly, and they relied heavily on people having previous experience. And so we decided. So I decided, okay, well, if we're gonna do a tech hive hackathon, we're gonna make it a lot more beginner friendly. And, uh, and then we decided to change it into a makeathon because we didn't want it to be focused mostly on programming. We we're going to uh, make it. so instead of a hacking marathon. Where you're just programming on the computer the whole time. It's amazing that where you're programming, building, thinking, yeah, making computer. Yeah, and how do you think that? I'm um, sorry. I I want you to ask that question to um to Ming in a second. Whatever you're going to say, and I totally interrupted. But um, I guess so. I'm I'm really interested in this idea of a makeathon versus a hackathon. And you mentioned that um. The hackathons that you have been to i've been to one hackathon before and it was not a teen hackathon so i think the idea of having first the idea of having a teen hackathon is pretty um uh novel it's a pretty interesting idea but also what do you think were some of the big differences in um like a idea of a hackathon versus your concept of this makeathon you want to start with that first and then i can yeah i mean i think that the biggest difference is that um, hackathons are really, really competitive, and they're not a very collaborative place, and um, that leads to not being very beginner friendly at all. So we really wanted to make it a lot more beginner friendly. Like all the teams could still work together, even though they were technically like competing against each other, um, which is not what happens at hackathons at all. Um, I guess also it's just that. We were building things instead of programming things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, for me, just thinking about how to support an activity like this when it came from the teens and the educators is something they wanted to do. Um, I love the idea of doing something that was around collaboration and not necessarily just competition and building up teamwork skills and. Also, that I know that hackathons oftentimes are very intimidating to girls, especially if they involve overnights um, and they're underage kids and a whole safety issue. Uh, so, variants like we had. Um, so, being able to provide a safe learning environment where it was a collaborative and team based, but also not an overnight, but still involved kind of two day intensive work. So, the things. The aspect of a hackathon that I really liked is that they're really, they're really technical, and you end with a, like the goal is to finish with a tangible something. Right? Uh, the things that I didn't like were that um, um, that um, you know sometimes this is can't stay overnight, um, and so we split it up into two days because usually hackathons are like a 24 hours start, like go for 24 hours straight, sleep whenever you can, go. Um, <laughs> or don't sleep. Uh, uh, what else? Uh, the hackathons are also pretty board centric. So there's mostly guys at these things. So we made a very conscious decision to, uh, we told everyone we're only going to recruit 50% girls, 50% guys. And so that's the, that uh, was another thing we did. And then the last thing was instead of the goal being like make the next feature app or startup or product or feature of this app, whatever, um, we decided to. Um, like the goal was to make a cute pet that will bring joy to a little kid and showcase it off in this like collaborative showcase plan. So that is like a like a fundamentally different type of um, incentive than a competition. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, that's really 
Yeah, it seems like this really, um, this idea of this makeathon and all the decisions you made into it were very deliberate. And it also seems like it reflects very much the way that Tech Hive works. At least that's the impression that I got. And Ming, when you say that it was um, collaborative, more collaborative than competitive, and that it was more beginner friendly than not beginner friendly, it seems like you're using a lot of the same language that you used when you described Tech Hive. Would you say that that's pretty accurate? Yeah, I would definitely say. Cool. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how the uh, how it actually. So I'm interested in the planning that went behind it. When I think that we uh, kind of dropped off with that, um, but first I think maybe we should explain how it was planned out and how uh, the role that Yu Ming and the rest of the interns played during the actual makeathon and. Um, who the participants were, because there was a difference, right? Um, so we started the idea in uh, uh, December, January, so like the new year, we had, I had the idea to do something like this. We didn't actually start planning it officially until March, and because we had other things that we had, other deliverables we had to, you know, push out for, through Tech Hive. And so in March is when the official planning for, like, ha, ah, we're gonna do a makeathon, let's go. Uh, that's when that happened. Um, we launched our Indiegogo campaign in April. And Indiegogo campaigns can only run for like 30 days. Uh, the campaign ended on May, like first week of May, which then allowed us the rest of May to you know, buy all the supplies, finish up like ordering things, um, like logistical planning, and then recruiting at the same time, uh, and then running at the end of May. That's like the, the big timeline. Uh, you want to talk about what you did? Yeah, I mostly worked on the uh, Indiegogo portion because I have a lot of experience with crowdfunding because um, I crowdfunded my own nonprofit. Uh, but, right, more, we should talk about that also. Yeah. But. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, we recruit Ming, and then we're like, oh, let's do this, non uh, let's do this uh, makeathon thing. Oh, where, how are we going to? How are we gonna raise funds for it? I know, Indiegogo campaign. So we're like in the process of like planning out, writing up the campaign, and then this email comes. Uh, did you send it to me? I did. Yeah, so Sherry sent me this email. I was like, hey look, me is presenting this, oh, I don't know, at this award ceremony. I watched the like I watched the award ceremony. I was like, oh my lord, Ming already like ran her own Indiegogo campaign, ran, like launched an initiative via Indiegogo. I was like, Ming, why haven't you told us this? You're uh, you're now on our team of planning. <laughs> Uh, I think it's a great great way of bringing the expertise and resources that each different team brings to yeah. Tech Hive and harnessing that um, in an important way and having them teach what they know to other people. Yeah, so because what happened was you know, we had two seniors in the Tech Hive, and Tech Hive is um, pretty normally distributed amongst all grades of high school. Uh, but two of the seniors asked like to, to run this thing, so I told them, like, okay, well, now you're in charge of. You know, helping me do the logistics of this this whole initiative, and then when we found out, when I found out that me could also have some Google experience, then um, then we asked them to also join us in, uh, into our into our in, uh, in our you know small group of people. There's there's you know three of us total, or four of us total that like, did the main logistics planning and fundraising, and then we invited the rest of the tech guys to help in various ways. So during the we provided lots of different skill building workshops as part of the Tech Hive experience um, and tried to fill in the gaps as well as bring on some new uh, skills, both in making and coding. And as part of the experience of the hackathon, um, rather than having uh, the Tech Hive educators also run the workshops, we handed that off to the teams to take a leadership role in running the workshops and teaching other teams as well. Great. So uh, just so I'm hearing this right, I mean, so I already know it, but for people who are watching this, so it sounds like you had a lot of teen input from the very beginning, that it wasn't just, uh, so teen input in terms of coming up with the idea for the hackathon or for the makeathon, uh, teen input from in terms of like people like Ming helping to run the Indiegogo campaign and to crowdsource some funding for this and also teen input in terms of, or I mean, team, the 
like teens actually leading the workshop to teach these participants um, in terms of all the technical, like the programming aspects and the building aspects. So we also did a good portion of the social media leading up to it, and as well as being featured in the videos and editing videos that is really needed to make a Indiegogo run. It's feeding the media machine and getting, getting all that work done ahead of time and launching that. Talk about what were the specific things you did for the Indiegogo campaign and um, Well, I mean, initially I sort of helped shape the story that we were going to tell on Indiegogo about like why we're interested in running the make fun, why like diversity and tech is important to us. Um, and then just continually updating people online via like Twitter and you know, Facebook. Facebook and yeah, emails to the people that have already donated and just reminding them like, we still exist, like tell your friends. Um, yeah. yeah, you guys did a really, really great job with that. Um, so I donated to the campaign and I thought it was really, I was just like, oh, wow, you know, they have this amazing staff that's putting this together and they're being so responsive. And I think it's a great example of how teens can really take leadership and like to drive something like this. It's a great job on that. And so we, oh, um, I was going to say, we also had a really great partner in the community. The, uh, the Children's Creativity Museum, mm -hmm. uh, where we hosted the event uh, in order to reach a broader number of teens. And they were also, because they were uh, a science, um, not a science center, but a, another institution in the community, they were able to use their social media channels to get the word out as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was like, so we, we had like uh, the Children's Museum helping us you know, generate a lot of. Uh, excitement for the actual makeathon, and then the robot petting zoo that culminated out of the uh, out of the makeathon. Then uh, Abby Ming and Alona, um, Alona was one of our other interns, um, worked on the Indiegogo campaign. And what we did was we actually found uh, one of my old college friends. Uh, she she came in as another as like an adult techno mentor uh, to like mentor the two girls on uh, like trying to make sure the campaign was always running and always sending out updates and stuff like that, uh, so that they wouldn't just be on the like out on their own. <laughs> um, and so what that did was so like Rachel, my friend Rachel Bellinger, um, plus um, Ming and Alona were doing Indiegogo campaigning, like raising money for us. So it allowed me and our other intern Sam to do like to develop like the workshops and the logistics and um, of the actual running the events. And so that's how I was able to talk to the creativity museum to locate a new spot uh, for the makeathon. Um, because the weekend we wanted to do it here at the hall is it was, it was, the hall was booked, so we decided to do it out in the community, and also in a place where we could, it was bartable, so that the participants from all over the bay could take Bart and like walk a block away, and then there, there you go, they're at the, the right. I think I thought that was really useful to. Um having gone to Lawrence Hall the weekend before for a mentor training and just how difficult that was on public transport. And that's something I feel like we talk about in new media a lot in terms of participation is a lot of these sites are so far from public transportation. It really, it can, um, it can prevent youth participation at times. So I think making that conscious, I mean, it sounds like it was kind of a serendipitous thing that the hall just happened to be booked. So you had to have it in downtown San Francisco in a place that, and for people who don't know what BART is, it's um, like the subway, it's Bay Area Rapid Transit. Um, one thing I wanted to go back on uh, just before we start to talk about um, AJ, your work with Sam and developing the actual workshops for this, uh, you mentioned Ming, and it was I love that you mentioned it in kind of this like like very casual way. But you know, we wanted to talk about in the Indiegogo campaign why diversity in tech is important. Um, I think that's a really huge thing to think about, and it's a really amazing conversation for um, especially teens to talk about with mentors and in these science museums. Can you tell me a little bit more about? like how you guys talk about like diversity and inclusion in spaces like Tech Hive, or how did this conversation begin? Um, well, I mean, there's a lot of girls at Tech Hive, which is really unusual for a place um, that has to do with tech, because when you go to things like hack bombs and stuff, 
you might see maybe like one or two other girls. Um, so like when we were talking about why diversity is important, like partially it was making like beginners comfortable again for the mix pod, but then also just like in general, it's interesting to have perspectives that are on Sherry's computer. Sure, what sure. Last, what was the last thing you heard? Um, so uh, Ming was talking a little bit about um, the importance of, uh, I think I think you had said that you had noticed at a couple of hackathons that you were at, it was mostly guys. But interestingly enough, um, Tech Hive is a lot of girls. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about why you think that might be or just other things that you've noticed around. And also, like, so would you consider yourself, um, what year are you? And are you thinking about a job or some sort of, like, uh, are you thinking about majoring in computer science or engineering or something like that? And I'm just kind of curious, like, what you think about what you've seen in hackathons versus what you experience in Tech Hive and the kind of opportunities you're helping to shape for, um, for girls or for people who don't consider themselves to be part of this movement otherwise. Um, sorry. Um. Sorry, but that was a lot of stuff. I'm just kind of curious, yeah, what, so what's been your experience in terms of like hackathons and just being one of the only girls in a room full of, let's say like guys who are like really involved in tech? There we go. Ha! Perfect. We're back. Um, Ming, maybe you should tell them what you're majoring in at, at University of Washington. Okay, so, well, I just graduated from high school, and... Oh, cool. Yeah, so I'm going to be... The name of my major is Human-Centered Design and Engineering, um, which is essentially design and computer science. Um, so I am staying in tech. And uh, so sort of, like, what my experience has been being, like, a woman around lots of guys. Yeah, yeah. So like, that's really cool that you're majoring in HCI. That's a really exciting, awesome field. And I'm just curious how you think, because uh, I also think that it's a big conversation that a lot of people are having, obviously, with like women and um, people who aren't, you don't typically see in technology as, you know, learning and feeling like they're part of this culture. So I guess my question was um, more about, your experience like is it something that you go out, walk into and you're like of course this is the way it should be or have you noticed at times that like i'm just trying to like tease out the differences between what you helped to build at tech hive and at the makeathon versus what you've seen um well i mean like the most negative thing that i feel like that happens a lot at tech events is like like hackathons, well specifically hackathons, is that there is like a lot of like sexual harassment that goes on. Um, and there was clearly none of that at the Megathon. Um, like for example, I went to High School Hacks, which was this spring, and like a lot of guys decided it was their opportunity to like test out all of their new pickup lines. I'm not really sure why the hackathon was their like most time moment, but uh, like that is something that I see a lot when I'm doing tech things besides like tech guys. Um, yeah, and what's what Ming's talking about is something that's really reported well in the literature, is and it's really one thing that's hard to to measure, but it's this. Uh, notion that there's a chilly climate and there's an atmosphere that's a bit hostile towards girls and women. Um, and it's hard to identify, but it's there. Um, yeah. And, you know, the subtle interactions, there's subtle ways of framing activities, um, ways of, you know, organizing groups um, that would um, cause, you know, girls and women to tune science, math, and engineering. And I mean, it's not even like, 
necessarily just interactions like in person it's like things online like there's huge communities of people that are like oh women shouldn't be in tech and like i mean if you saw like the whole gamergate like fiasco um i've had people come up to me and be like i think gamergate was a good thing and i was like wait what is gamergate uh I <laughs> yeah, we can frame it for the so Gamergate was essentially when a lot of women who were working in the gaming industry were being threatened by men online and so they were getting a lot of like death threats, a lot of rape threats just because they thought that gaming was just for men and was like not a place where women should be and it was like I mean the most high profile one was Anita Sarkeesian uh, who I forget what exactly she did, but she was going to give a lecture at a university in, I want to say Utah, and this guy was like, well, if you give the lecture, I'm going to go and shoot all the students in the audience, and like, and you, and then um, the security guards refused to search the people going into the lex lecture, and then so she had to cancel it, and then that's when it kind of like blew up in the media. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. There are all sorts of examples of this also in the design world, in the gaming world, just early on when a lot of the women programmers and game designers were allowed to get access to uh, developer tools, but the kinds of narratives that were supported for development were around like um, they favored you know, single, single shooter or shooting games. So, you know, we, yeah. we favor marketing games that have bullets and guns and fighting scenarios and competitive boxing things where a lot of the female and women designers wanted to create puzzle narratives um uh, creativity uh you know uh, looking at social narratives just different ways of interacting but they were not given the proper licenses to actually even get access to the software and then even if they did develop a game they were not marketed because they were told that these were not the things that people wanted yeah. So it was necessarily exclusionary and not kind of embracing the diversity of perspectives, the diversity of stories that could be told, and the diversity of different learner, learner interactions. And I mean, like, even if women would enjoy games like shooter games, if you look at any of the women characters that are in a lot of games, they'll be, like, essentially naked. <laughs> and, like, we'll, we'll just, like, it's, like, a really overly sexualized image that's in a lot of these games. So that might not make you want to play it as much. I don't know. <laughs> so for this particular makeathon, um, which and I heard the idea that the the teens and my educators wanted to do this, and it was this idea that that the individual parts were were bigger than the whole, um, and that would be a zoo of individual animals. It was a very friendly, family centric narrative. Um, it allowed each kid to be creative in their own way. Uh, and the whole was just kind of this, you know, beautiful menagerie of animals, um, which was really in contrast to what we had already been seeing in most hackathons. Yeah, so, I, so if there was one thing I would say I was designing for and creating this entire experience was to create a safe space. And so, I think it's a word that we always use a lot in our in our in like the Unity labs and all that. But um, um, it's I, I definitely hold that as like maybe one of my number one design choices. So. How can we create not only a safe space for our interns and participants and our, and our women, our young, our young women, but how do we also create a welcoming space? And so we, we, we make it very clear when everyone enters the space is that it's about making the space like, you know, you know beginner friendly, welcoming to other, other people. Uh, when it comes to like the gender thing, we actually do have to make a, you know, we have to make, we have to cut it off and like, like we only allow 50% you know, guys, 50 percent girls. Like it's a it's a thing that we have actually consciously been doing to make sure like that it's balanced because we get way more guy applicants sometimes, uh, or at least for the tech hive, and then uh, than we do for girls. And so um, actually, what happened because we marketed this as and we told everyone like when you apply for the to be a participant on our makeathon, we're only going to randomly select 50 percent of the guys and 50 percent girls. We actually had a lot more girls apply for this thing because they're like, oh, okay, I, I, I'm guessing that's what happened when they saw this as an opportunity. 
Yeah, I think it's great that you guys had these really deliberate conversations beforehand. And this is kind of why I keep on like encouraging you um, to talk about the idea of like this deliberate make a thon and thinking about it being, um, I guess, a safe space. And I think a safe the term safe space is something get, that gets used so much. We almost don't know, like, what does it mean? But but like really framing in context of like, you know, this has been my experience so far. This is what I see my peers going through and I don't want to do that. And I want to kind of attack this head on by having these deliberate conversations with my peers about this and putting on this event that talks about the stuff very deliberately as opposed to uh, just not talking about it, which is, a deliberate, it's a, it's a deliberate decision also. Yeah. And then the last thing is, the reason why I chose a robot petting zoo, I mean, it's, this is an idea that we came up with ourselves, like I think MakerBot had a robot petting zoo at Maker Fair last year, and then they took it to South by Southwest this year. Um, but I, uh, the reason I chose that idea, as opposed to, you know, BattleBots, which is the, the, the stereotypical thing that people think about when they think robots, was that because we, uh, some of my, interns um, and I, we participated in a robotics competition a few years ago. And, you know, it's just like, you know, kind of battle bots, these robots, they played this game on the field and it's a competitive competition. But I saw the finals and it was nothing but guys on the, on the final playing field, literally no girls on that playing field. And then everyone would look like what you would stereotype as a, like an engineer. And so I, I was like, this is, while this is a great technical uh, and like camaraderie experience, it's not breaking any stereotypes, and it's not like broadening the participation of this highly technical and um, curated field. So that's yeah. why I think about heading zero. I would say moreover, it's not that interesting or innovative either. It's like, how many times have you seen battle bots? It's like, you're just taking on this model and replicating it. And although it's like, you know, some people can really sink their teeth into that, it's nothing new and it's nothing that particularly exciting or creative. Yeah. Um, so uh, some, I guess I would like to also like to talk about uh, the curriculum that you designed for this. I'm using that word curriculum kind of loosely, but um, so you had all of these teens that joined in as participants. You had your Tech Hive intern teens. They were more of like, uh, like they were the ones that planned this thing out. How did you, um, so I know how you recruited these teens, you put a call out, but then how did you ensure that they would know what they needed to know in terms of the programming and the building sides once you brought them on? Yeah, so um, before we officially started the Makeathon, like, so, you know, the teens checked in on that first day, but uh, before, like, we told them, like, this is the actual prompt and this is your time to build, we, we took about three hours to do like, a really hands-on, intensive workshop. Um, and in this workshop, they took three, you know, well, this three-hour workshop, they took three separate workshops. Um, the first one was taught by my, my colleague, Andrew. Uh, it was kind of like a basics. This is how you plug things in. This is how you turn it on. Um, but then the two other workshops were designed by Tech Hive interns. So um, throughout April and May, uh, we, I split up the Tech Hive interns into small groups, and I had them design workshops uh, so that um, to teach at this makeathon, um, and the and the, the prompt I gave my, uh, my interns was um, in thirty minutes, um, guide uh, some beginners with absolutely no experience to the project and have them build a little like uh, like a little dancing pet that responds to sound, and then uh, so here is an example. So here is the first workshop, right? So they created these little um, these little rabbits, and um, you know they put motors right here and they. And uh, the, you know the, the interns, you know, they pre-made a lot of the things so that so the workshop can like kind of go within thirty minutes. They, um, they tested it out um, every weekend, every Saturday they were there, really up to the makeathon. They tested it out with some of the visitors on the museum floor. And we actually tested it out with like eight year olds. I was like, okay, this is going to work with eight year olds. It's definitely going to work with high schoolers. So, <laughs> and then what we did was like we would at first we would you know bring you know three eight year olds in at a time. And then we'd slowly do, you know, eight, eight year olds. And then we did, and then our interns taught the mentors, so like you say, by the weekend mm -hmm. before the makeathon, our interns, you know, taught the adult mentors. And then at the actual makeathon, they, so they had, by the time the makeathon happened and they, they, they taught the workshop, they taught, you know, they had practiced this like eight times already. So they yeah. Continuous workshop. 
Yeah, so the general structure is that there were two smaller workshops um, that would ground their basic skills um, in coding within those two little workshops. And then they were grouped into teams uh, and loosely assigned teams to make sure that they had a diversity of skills within those teams. Uh, and then we were asked to build uh, an original design. And the constraint that we placed on that one is that their animal had to fit within a certain size cage. Um, <laughs> cage, really, it's a, a floor pen. So we wouldn't get huge animals and use too much cardboard that would include kind of smaller motors from moving the cardboard. Um, and then we also had these categories, which helped. Um, I would say that, you know, giving a couple constraints were useful, but also inspired their creativity. Um, I'm forgetting all the categories. So, so we told them that when the robot petting zoo opens, your robot has to be, your robotic pet has to be open in, at the, in the zoo, and um, the visitors like will come and they'll be able to feed your robot paper, you know, get a piece of paper. Um, but they'll also get to choose, like to vote on their favorite pets. And there are four categories: there was the hungriest pet, and there was the cutest pet, the most talented pet, and the wow. wildest pet. <laughs> so these are just like silly. Like little competitions. It wasn't like, like I didn't tell him. Like we told him that you know whoever wins the pet itself gets the award, and so it stays with the pet. And it's like it wasn't like super low. It wasn't very competitive at all. It was just more like just an, an extra way for the like, visitors to interact with you. Um, and that's what we did. Uh, and then uh, talk about safe space again. Uh, when we grouped them into teams, uh, one of the things we did was we, like we didn't let people pick their teams. We asked everyone to. Kind of like tell us what they think they thought their strengths was, and we told them we're going to separate people by strengths so that every team had like a strong person in one skill set and a strong person in another skill set. Because the goal here was to teach each other as opposed to compete with each other. So we actually told them that and made that expectation up front. And I think that was also one of the little things that helped just create that safe space. Yeah, absolutely. Because then you just have like a team of ringers, like people who really wanted to geek out on the programming side or uh, something like that. Um, I should. I also wanted to ask you, what were the tools and materials you used? Because I don't think we've said that yet. Um, okay. okay. So I'll I'll use. It. Uh, so we we based our tools off of the hummingbird kit. So the hummingbird kit is really great. Um, and the design decisions behind using the hummingbird kit was that. Uh, actually, here, one Ming, had you used the hummingbird robotics kit before? Uh, no. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit about? Yeah, the, I'd like to share a little bit about this. So, a couple years ago, um, through a colleague, I had met Tom Lowers, who is the developer of the hummingbird kit. And he had just developed this board, and um, I was just starting out the team program, and he um, had donated some boards to us, and we also purchased some boards as well, um, and just tried them out um, with a very small number of teams, and it looked like a really um, accessible way of learning robotics and controls and sensors. Um, and uh, we started in on different prototyping activities and kind of came back to this as a really useful thing after exploring a range of different things. And what have you found is easier about the Hummingbird Robotics Kit as opposed to, say, using something like Arduino or using another thing like, um, I don't know, like uh, the Pico Cricket, which I think is not made anymore? Like, I know that, AJ, you're a big Hummingbird Robotics Kit fan. Yeah. Can you talk about why you like it or why you think it's particularly useful in your programming? Yeah, so we have to. You know what? I'm trying to pull up a. Hold on, screen share. Entire screen share. There we go. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to pull up a picture of the. Uh, picture of uh, present in new window. There we go. Can you see? Yeah. The kit? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so K5, if you could just like click on the that little tab so that everyone can broadcast. Yep. The, yeah. Um, all right. So I used the Hummingbird Kit for three reasons. Um, when we created this whole, um, we were trying to pick the right, the best design tool uh, for this to build robots. Uh, we found three bad hards, and uh, to build a robot, and 
and the bad hards were um, around the three kind of disciplines of building a robot. So electronics, programming, and building, right? And so for the electronics, the bad hard we found was breadboarding and kind of wiring and building a little circuit. That's like even college students don't know how to build a circuit. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, AJ, I'm just going to pause you for one second. So I love this term that you have called bad hards. Oh, yeah. So you have good or good. Is it? Can you explain that? Yeah. Before? yeah. So we, um, our, my colleague Andrew, like he started using this word, these, these terms, good hard and bad hard. And good hard was. Um, you know the things that kind of like help you like it's like oh they're, they're challenging they're challenging but they're also like motivational it's like oh I want to like solve this this ch challenge whereas a bad heart is like you know what screw it I'm done I'm not gonna work <laughs> I think yeah from the learning perspective I mean a good heart is something that challenges your problem solving skills yeah. and challenges you to think carefully and deeply. Um, and you know, at the end, you learn some new skills and knowledge about that, and hopefully, you're more empowered that you solve something. And the bad part might be something um, like that's just incredibly tedious. That once you've learned it the first time, you don't really learn much more after that. Um, like you know, gluing sequins onto a card piece of cardboard that one could spend hours doing, but you've already done it once. And it's, there's not a lot of learning value. Um, right. So removing that part of it. And so I would say that soldering is an example of one of these activities. It's a bad hard for beginners. For for beginner, it's great to solder, but you know if you were asked to solder that instead of trying to develop a piece of code to figure out why this isn't working. Yeah. Ming, can you describe a a common bad hard that you run into? If it's whether it's programming or building. Um. Bad hard. Or that you see people run into a lot, where they just get so frustrated, they just want to drop their project entirely. Well, I mean, like debugging is a bad one. <laughs> like when you're searching for that missing semicolon or whatever on your code, that's the worst thing. Totally um, agreed. Yeah. So, what? How about for building? For building, um, trying to figure out which part your circuit is broken. That's what I, that's Which is kind of the same thing, right? <laughs> As like debugging, like oh, if it's the battery is in upside down, or yeah. well, if it turns out your sensor is actually broken, and right, yeah, to diagnose, you know, some other problems, and it turns out you've got bad equipment to start with, I mean, you really don't, you know, there's there's some um, sort of uh, troubleshooting, but you know, when troubleshooting turns into a two-hour activity, it's just not no yeah. longer fun. That's not all right, so with that said, now we kind of understand the good heart and the bad heart. Yes, yes, um, please go ahead. Uh, so the Hummingbird uh, allows you to attach like a motor or a sensor or an LED directly to this thing. Whereas, you know, and then the nice thing, like whereas if you have an Arduino, which is you know, on the other side of this, of this, of this board, um, you have to create a circuit and you have to attach breadboards, you have to solder, it's hard. So, uh, so from the electronics perspective, the good heart um, or you know, it, it, this the hummingbird gets rid of the bad heart of, of like wiring. Uh, for programming, so Ming was talking about finding that one semicolon in your code. Uh, so most programming languages are syntax, you know, word based, and the hummingbird kit works with Scratch, which is block based, and so that gets rid of all of that bad heart. There's no typing and the typing and figuring out like all because it's just a block. If you want, you know, three things to happen, you just put three blocks right after each other. So that's super easy. And then for the, the last thing is, um, um, I think you can see on the, on the, you know, on our kit list, you see those like cardboard parts that we cut out. So we laser cut out some parts, uh, like a wheel, um, that little cube on the bottom left. That's kind of like an L bracket, so you can attach things to like a motor, um, and then, um, and then those long, those long bar things. Those are called linkages. And so if you ever want a motor to move other things, here, this is what it looks like here. Uh, linkages. So these are like this. This a lot. Like this allows you to make uh, moving things much easier than it is to just build it from scratch from cardboard. Um, and then the linkages are all connected to this this thing called a make do, which is like a zip tie. And then you can zip tie back together. Um, and then if you notice the servos on uh, let's see on the uh, on the kit, we added these like a little acrylic. Pieces around the servos to make it really easy to attach, like this make do, to do the thing. 
So actually, do you want to do you want to see our, our little turtle example? Uh, yeah, I think you know we don't have that much time left, but I would love to show off some of the examples. Yeah. So here's a turtle. Let's see if I can do this right. And um, this is kind of a plea out to whoever runs make dues to <laughs> to bring them back because they've they've stopped producing them. Correct. Yeah, so they stop making them. They don't look like this anymore. They look like little screws now, and it's kind of unfortunate. So they actually require, you know, like a um, a screwdriver, and an extra tool, whereas the original make just hand. Yeah, and then the new screws they don't work very well as like joints. Um, yeah, whereas these work really really well for joining things. So here's. Let's see. Can you see my? Yep, turtle? I'm on it right now. I see your face right now. There you go, the turtle. <laughs> His head po po you know, goes in and out. <laughs> and then if I take off its shell, you can see the insides. And so you see right here we have, you know, the hummingbird kit is right here. And it may look like a rat's nest, but compared to other electronics projects, this is nothing. <laughs> Because you know these three wires right here that I'm holding are for the sensor. This, these four wires right here are for the two you know motors right here that turn the wheels. And then this one right here is for the servo, which is attached to here. And so if you see, you can see the so these parts all kind of move together, and they're all really they're all removable. You can just take it apart. So one thing that uh, I noticed when we, so during the mentor training, what, the thing that I thought was really useful is you had some of these finished products to show us, and the first thing you had us do, because we opened these up and we were like, whoa, this is a rat's nest, and a, for a few of us who had never done robotics before, it was pretty intimidating to see that, and you uh, you and your teens ran us through this, um, uh, what is that called? It's like an agency by design protocol that was yeah. just basically like what do you see, what do you notice with this thing, name all of the parts and you give us about 10 minutes to really go through every single element and it made us slow down, it totally removed the panic from the situation and it made it so okay well we're working in a group, this looks like a motor, I what are the numbers here, what do you think that means? So I thought that, that was a really great um, uh, a really great way of helping us to understand how this all worked. Yeah, we use this uh, protocol that Agency by Design uses called Parts, Purposes, and Complexities. And so the first thing I asked, I asked everyone when they got trained was, what are the parts in this working turtle? Like, move it around. So just label everything, right? First, just you know, state the obvious. This is a, a, a bar-looking thing. This is another bar-looking thing. These little blue things are here. There's another, like, cardboard piece here. This looks like a rectangle, this head. It also looks like a head. This looks like a little bracket thing. And then we asked them, like, okay, what are the purposes of all these things? Like, oh, looks like this right here attaches these linkages together. And um, and then this right here, maybe this is, maybe this is, uh, you know, they, and then you can ask questions, like, what does this do? It's like, oh, this is the brains of the robot. Um, and uh, it's like, oh, wait, why do we have a power brick? Oh, well, because you need to power all the motors. Things like that. Great. Not too un unlike a lot of, um, kind of early science experiments where you had to do it the section first, um, kind of taking things apart and examining them, to understand what the parts are. Um, before Cool. So I guess I wanted to take the last five minutes to ask you guys some questions about uh, if you were to do this all over again. What, or if someone at another library or museum or something like that wanted to have their own make-a-thon, what are some recommendations you would give? Like, what are some of the lessons learned from you folks at TechHive? Um, well, I would have loved to have more participants. So like spending a lot more time recruiting because I think we spent like a week recruiting. We spent like <laughs> we spent two weeks like really recruiting, uh, but the it was like I think the application process was open for like four weeks, but we were just so strapped for time and tired and like, we had a lot of other things going on that 
So we would definitely recruit longer and for hard, like recruit harder, I guess. Yeah, I would say that um, that is also the case that we uh, would love to also recruit more mentors. But something that was sort of 2020 hindsight was that effort wasn't just about scaffolding kids and getting them into working in a marathon, but it was also building up a mentor community and building a community of learning. Sorry, Sherry, I can't quite hear you. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm going to get closer to the mic here. It's uh, been nice to um, be able to have a different structure for how to engage mentors um, at different levels of commitment. So I, I know that many of the teachers were not able to commit the full 18 hours um, to do this as a big commitment. And as a result, we lost the participation of a lot of teachers who would have been interested had we given them options to engage um, you know, with different, different periods of time. Great. Yeah. This round, we asked mentors to be there for all 24 hours. <laughs> we did have a range of mentors, you know, from yeah. teachers to librarians to people in the community. Um, uh, uh, as mentioned, we some more. Okay. Um, so my next question would be, if there are some sites that are seeing this uh, hangout and are really interested in learning more about this or seeing how they could possibly host something like a makeathon at their site, where is uh, where is the best place for them to go or how can they find out more about uh, the logistics and maybe even some of these 30-minute workshops that uh, your teens developed? Right, so we're in the process of writing all of this up, um, and uh, we would love some participation of um, the community to give us feedback on these documents, and we'd love to post them up on our website. Um, I want to encourage everyone to go to the Hummingbird Kit site because there is a community forum there um, where other educators are sharing their examples, so they should definitely go there. Yeah, there's already a wealth. There's a wealth of knowledge already on Hummingbird Kits. And it's like the Hummingbird Robotics Kit website. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, this project was done in part with support from the National Science Foundation for one of my grants <coughs> from Paper Mechatronics. Uh, and so we will be launching a website and looking to archive and share out some of the lessons that we learned from the project on the site. Uh, soon, probably launching at the end of the summer. Uh, at the end of when? Sorry? Sorry, end of the summer. End of the summer, great. We already have some preliminary documentation on this website, uh, on, on this project, uh, on our website, techhivestudio.org. Um, yeah, techhivestudio.org. And uh, on the top, there's a link that says Makeathon. So that, that's the Makeathon page already. Um, so there's already some stuff on there. We're going to be I'm updating it within you know, this week and next week. So. Great. And then that website also allows you to get in contact with us like, directly. So. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys so much for participating, and thank you for being so uh, candid about um, about this whole process, and also about I, I really appreciate you sharing um, some of the reflections that you've had from other experiences with technology and some obstacles to participation. So thank you for that. That was I think that was really important. And I feel like you know a lot of people say um, a lot of people begin to have these conversations but don't really go into um, their own experiences. So I appreciate that. And also I'm just really excited to be able to share the great work that you guys have all done. Um, any last things that you want to share? Uh, well, I just want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about this and document our process in this And also, yeah. and, and being a mentor to kind of express from the inside as well. Thank yeah. You. So. This is something that I don't I don't know if this came across full disclosure I was a mentor for this so I got to see a lot of these things firsthand and I also know that in planning big projects like this you put all of this time and sweat into the actual planning and you don't I never budget in time for reflection or for um, really describing at you know just like at the most basic level what happened and why it was important. So I'm, I'm glad that I was able to be part of uh, your dissemination. Thank you. Yeah. All right, cool. All right, I'm going to stop the broadcast now. Talk to you guys later. I'll see you. Bye.